Hi everybody, this is Julie Ferns Pheasant. This is our very first interview of the Isolation uh, and Beyond project and I'd really like to introduce to you um, a very dear friend of mine who I used to teach with actually and we've both moved on from that and we're creatives now. Virginia O'Keefe is a textile artist and a poet uh, and a really interesting person so um, I'm just going to introduce you to her and we're going to have a nice chat. So um, I hope you enjoy the interview. So Virginia, what was your starting point? Who do you think was the person or a maybe a time in your life that made you realise that you really want to, to be a creative, to perhaps start quilting or sewing, or even your poetry? Who was the person that really inspired you? Or persons, or maybe even a book? I, I don't really think there was any one person. Um, I've always, even when I was small, I wrote. I wrote stories as a child and um, I failed sewing at school. <laughs> I thought I'd never pick up a needle again or sew anything, but my grandmother was quite creative and, um, and I just kept on dabbling in things. And, uh, and eventually when we came to Rolly Stone, I enrolled in a class in uh, patchwork. Because you know, you see the pictures of them in the books, they look so nice. And I thought, oh, I'd like to learn to do that. But I hate following patterns. So I, I was never very good. I couldn't get the points to meet and you know, my stitches weren't regular and it was horrible. And then one day, oh, Jean Ray Laurie, she's, an, she's now dead, but she was an American quilter, very famous. And she came to Perth and gave a, a lecture. And um, she just said, there are no rules. And she had photos of, or quilts of people holding egg beaters flying up into the sky and um, Alabama senators who'd said that women should be in the kitchen barefoot and pregnant. So she made all these satirical little quilts. And I thought, oh, that's my woman. And I was free, I was liberated and I was able to do my own thing. <laughs> so, so is that why, is that another reason why you perhaps do this social commentary on your quilting because of that, of the inspiration? Of well, I, I was quietly, surreptitiously at home making those, but I never showed them to anyone because they weren't de rigueur, you know, they weren't what was accepted as quilts or quilting. And so when when I saw what this woman did, I thought, oh, I can bring them out into the light. <laughs> I've been doing them ever since, yeah. I can remember, you've actually won an award um, for, for, what was that quilt? That, that was, you um, it was called Migrant Mothers or Migrant my grandmother's and it was president's choice so it's a very subjective choice it's not judged on any criteria but I, I took all the women who emigrated to Australia and I made cartoons of their heads and uh, I put them on a background of um, smoggy London and then um, Australian waters and so on on a boat and I and I peopled the boat with my grandmothers um, who'd all emigrated as children or as women and brides and so on and decorated sounds, them. Sounds it's wonderful. on my bed, I'll haul it out later on, you can have a quick look. <laughs> so when, you, when you're creating your quilt, do you think of, because, but being an artist myself, I'm thinking of the colour choice. What, uh, what um, gives you your colour choice? How do you decide on the colours um, and the shapes perhaps that you use in your quilting? With the mining series, it was completely dictated by using the, um, the men's work clothes, which I got in op shops. So I had quite a deep yellow, a deep blue and orange and the, and the, the fluoro uh, silver that stripes, you know. That. Is this the FIFO um, series that yeah. I've just seen, which yes. we'll, we'll see in a, in a, yeah. a little while. Um, but that's fabulous that you've used all the FIFO colours. Mm. I tried to get hold of some pink for a women's ones, but I struggled and so I haven't used that yet. I had paint. But um, with others, I, it's less the colour so much as, as the design and I like to recycle uh, fabrics. So I belong to a group called Exotica and 
which is a strip club we discovered in Perth. <laughs> but we're not the strip club. And, uh, I, and we use unusual textiles. So I use uh, tea towels or, or flower bags or we've recycled uh, furnishing fabrics, um, curtains, you know, things that aren't considered quilting fabrics per se. So yeah. it's more like that. What suits the concept of the quilt is what I go for. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. So if we were looking, if we were talking about your processes and your methods, what do you find the, the most cathartic if you were kind of getting into the flow? What is the stage of making a quilt that you find the most cathartic or the one that you feel the most comfortable with? Probably when I'm really engaged with a topic, like doing that, uh, doing a couple of the mining ones and doing the COVID quilt, I, I made that one in two and a half days because I was just so enthusiastic and I thought, oh, I'll grab a bit of this and I'll grab a bit of that. Oh, I might add this on there. Oh, that'll go well with that. So I'll put that across the bottom. There's no plan. It just evolves. And I feel so good when something like that happens. It's, it's really releasing and it's a lot of fun. But if I have to worry about things, then I don't enjoy it so much and you can block up very quickly. So a bit like uh, I know myself personally that if I know I have to go into a, a, a competition, say, or, or an entry for a particular exhibition, um, you know, I find that very constrictive. So something that you that you personally choose mm. is, is where you feel the most comfortable. Oh, absolutely. Like this one that I'm working on over there the, with the paper, um, it had very strict criteria. And I'm not sure that I've actually covered it, but I've worked on it anyway, and what I've done, I've enjoyed doing. So if it's accepted, that's a bonus. If it's not, I've still ended up with something that I've enjoyed doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Um, so I know that your, besides your textiles, um, your poetry is is really well regarded, and you've you've won awards with that as well. Mm. When did you feel that? Uh, you know, besides your love of literature and, and words, when did you really get into your poetry and, and what inspires you the most? What's the theme that you... I, I know you're great with humour. I love your... I've heard some of your humorous poetry. Um, probably where I used to live over east. I write a lot of poetry based on that landscape in northeast Victoria. Um, I started to take it seriously I entered, um, I actually went and spoke to Matt Otley, who's an author and illustrator, and he, he uh, read some of my work and gave me some pointers, and that was in 2007, I think. And, um, and I, taking on Matt's confidence, I entered the Tom Collins, which is a writer's award here, and I got a, a highly commended, I was shortlisted, in fact, which was really good. And um, that was a long time ago, and I won my first uh, pri prize money, <laughs> so it was very exciting. And I suddenly thought, wow, this is, this is a professional competition with people from all over the, Australia and elsewhere, and I've actually got in the top 10 or top five or whatever, and I, I must be okay if I can do that. Um, so I've been, and I've been shortlisted twice for the Tom Collins, and I've won other prizes in the Creatrix Award and um, and so on. So it's been it's been good. And I, but again, I think it's like with a lot of creatives, you you feel good at the time, and then suddenly you can go down in a screaming heap and think, what I'm doing is absolute rubbish, you know. And and I just stop. And it's you have to keep telling yourself that you you can do it and you're okay. Actually, that, that was one of my, my next question, and I know it's going to be a difficult one, and please only share what you feel comfortable with, but I know through, you've had some real tragedy in your family, um, in, in well, what's happened to your family, and that has also either um, curtailed your creativity or maybe even in, enlightened it. Could you perhaps share that time when you were going through the, the family? Mm. Difficult times. My uh, my family live in northeast Victoria, and earlier this year, uh, they basically went missing during the fires. And for three days, we had no idea whether they were okay or not. And then um, on the third day, they came out in a convoy, 
and uh, to Albury. And, and then we found out the day later that their houses have burnt down. So that's my mother, who will be 98 next month, and my sister. And uh, it's been very hard for me because I was planning, I had a ticket to go over in April to see them, and, uh, and then COVID struck. So I'm the only one in the family, because I live so far away, that's not really come to terms with the loss of my family home. And it was my family home. I mean, I've been going there since I was 16. And as I said earlier, I get a lot of my creative inspiration from that landscape. And uh, it, I didn't realise how much it had affected me until, because I wrote articles, I write articles for our local paper, newspaper magazine. And I wrote several articles about what happens to your family when they go missing in a fire crisis. And I, I pulled one up uh, last week and I was just rereading it and I burst into tears. And I just, I couldn't really go on. And I realised how much it had affected me mentally because I've seen photos, but not being there um, has been very, very hard and I still can't go because everybody's in lockdown and we can't leave. And it just stymied me. I made the COVID quilt because it was quick and easy to do and then I just, I just couldn't go on. I couldn't do anything else. I'd come to this realisation that I'm in this mental hole and how am I going to crawl out of it? It was very hard. Do you think that you have been able to do that or do you think that you need to actually go to where your home was to be able to move on from that eventually? I, I would love to go back, um, and I will, but I've been lucky in that um, I wasn't going to enter this competition that's going to be exhibited in, well, it's not a competition, it's an exhibition in September. And I actually contacted the organisers and said, no, no, I'm, put, I'm withdrawing. I just don't have the ability to, to do anything. And a very dear woman said to me, why don't you use your poetry that you've done in the past? And I, I'd never even considered doing that. And I thought, that's not a bad idea. That's quite different from what I had planned to do. I'd, I'd actually planned to do this long hanging and I'd gone out and I'd collected kangaroo bones and I'd, I'd bleached them and I'd done all sorts. But that's as far as I got. I just couldn't bring myself to physically make anything. And so I thought long and hard about doing, making the poetry into a, a freestanding um, exhibit. And then, I, and then I went down in a heap again. I thought, no, no, I, I just can't. I can't, it's rubbish, it's no good. It's very amateurish, it's horrible. And then I, I looked through a book on bookmaking and I contacted Liz Powell, who's a, an Eastern States bookmaker, whom I've worked with. And I said, can you help me, Liz, if I do this of this dimensions, what do I need and so on? And I got an, which is what I love about people. She emailed me back straight away and said, you need this, you need that, and good luck with it. And you know, and I was, and I just, all of a sudden, burdens just fell off because somebody had faith in me that I could actually produce this. And if I wanted to make it four foot high, then it was possible, you know. And um, so it didn't, it didn't have to be a quilt. No, it didn't have to be a method that you were used to. You're almost combining mm -hmm. um, words and visuals but in a different way, and maybe that, that'll creep back in I'm hoping, eventually. I'm hoping so. Um, I still can't, I've got a, a very formal quilt out there that I started for my mother, which is a pattern, and, uh, and I'm struggling to finish it. Um, it. All I have to do is hand quilt it, and I, I haven't picked it up for weeks. It's uh, not the time yet. No, it's not. And, but I'm, I'm, I've begun to enjoy the process of making this, this uh, exhibit. Um, so, and I have, you know, I have to thank Julia, who was the woman that contacted me and Liz for sort of saying, yes, you can do it. Um, uh, but I'm still nervous about actually putting the pages together because if I cut in the wrong place, it's all gonna fall in a screaming heap. And <laughs> I'm, I'm hanging off, I'm hanging off, but eventually I will have a go, bite the bullet. Yeah. Well, from what I've seen, it looks fabulous. 
it's, so, uh, it's a sort of lack of faith in your own ability. Absolutely. I think, I think that's one of our worst things as creatives mm. is our own is our own belief system in ourselves, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so if we were, if you were say, if you had the young Virginia O'Keefe sitting across from you right now, and you were saying, and the young Virginia was going through what you're going through, or, um, or what you've been through, what would your be advice be to get that creativity back, to get the verve back, to get the, the feeling that I can do this? I think I'd, I'd probably tell her to not worry about anybody else because everybody else is worrying about themselves. Absolutely. And uh, so it's pointless. It achieves absolutely nothing. Um, it might make you feel good mentally somehow or other in a peculiar way, but it's it's absolutely pointless. And um, you, you just need to go ahead and what the Nike thing, just do it. Because if you don't grab it, the metal and strike, then you're going to be always living in some sort of mental and creative limbo. And is that what you want? No, it's not what you want. So if it fails, then you get up and you have another go. Um, for example, the back page on my book, I uh, put the spine on the wrong side and I had to go out last night and, and cut it and reattach it and weigh it down and I'm going, oh, you stupid woman. But I didn't sit there and go, oh, woe is me. I just went out and went, you know, you've, you've made a mistake. You won't ever do that again because it's cost you time and effort. Um, you learn. So don't worry about making mistakes. Yeah. So the so you might have found that if that mistake hadn't happened, the look of the, the book and, and the, the feel of the book might not be as interesting as no. it is now. <laughs> so you've actually achieved something that you might not yeah. have achieved if it hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. So is there, is there one last thing that you would like to say about the fact of um, being a creative in isolation or during a struggle, is there one piece of advice that you think is the real one that you would like to finish with today? I think if you could um, get in touch with other creative people because you can't always do it on your own. You have to have input from others um, and generally it's positive input. People I've found, I've been lucky I suppose, they're very positive. I don't get negative feedback. Um, I get critical feedback, but that's a different thing. Uh, and I think people will often just say, how about you try that? Or what about putting that there? And it sets you off on a completely different tangent and you're away again. You know, it's like going down a river and do you take this little rivulet or do you take that tributary or whatever? And it's, it's exciting. You're not totally sure where you're going to end up, but that input is, is really useful. I, I actually find that I absolutely agree with you about the, the group thing. And you were saying, uh, just as an afterthought, you, you mentioned that you, you work with a group of, of creators sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you really miss that when you don't have that group? Mm. That, like mm. when, during COVID and we were in isolation, that must have been so difficult. It was, and we got together last month and you've never heard more excited women in your life. It was like parrots on steroids. We were just, we went mad. And it was so good to get back together again. And it was amazing how creative we've all been. One woman, I think, made eight pieces. And I'm talking, you know, large quilts. Another woman made four. Uh, we just we just all went bonkers creating. What, that's what we do, you know? Like, yeah, it was terrific. It was a lot of fun. We're so glad. We all fell on each other's necks. We weren't meant to, but we did. <laughs> so in 2016, you went to India, and that, I believe, was also uh, a time of real inspiration for you, particularly because of a particular exhibition that you saw of some women's work. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, it was in um, uh, Butch or, or Kutch, uh, up in Rajasthan, and we were very lucky in that uh, our group went there late in the afternoon with the only people there and the architect who was French and the curator met us and showed us around and we saw all 
the uh, different women's work in small cubicles and uh, it was so inspiring because we saw the uh, tree of life and those animals that I talked about in my poem were exhibited on these pieces of cloth which were woven or embroidered and stitched and so on. It was just fantastic work. Did, and you, did you get to meet some of the women at no. all? No. No, oh, no, not there, but we did. We actually went to villages. The whole point of the tour is it's a textile tour and you meet people who are uh, working uh, for non-profit organisations. So they're... Um, they are subsidised and they helped to uh, maintain the tradition because everything's becoming mechanised now and so the idea like the chicken workers for example, you remember those lovely Polish embroideries that we used to wear when we were, well that's a similar sort of thing that they do and they sit there and they just embroider away satin stitch and, and you know herringbone and all these and they're glorious, they're absolutely beautiful or um, uh, just trying to think. Um, the ones you, I used to buy these in the Fremantle markets, long pieces of cloth, and you'd pull a thread and it would all seem to unravel, but they were dyed, so they were, they'd so, they'd like so little knots all across the cloth, and then they'd dye them like tie dyeing, and then you'd pull those cloths out and you've got all these little dots across it. And I used to think, oh, it's not finished, but it is in actual fact. And we used to sit there and watch these women doing this. So we would go from village to village watching dyers and printers, um, screen printing and um, block printing, which is fabulous. Yeah. And they'd have, probably the form tables would be maybe 20 or 30 feet long and they'd roll out the calico across them and then they'd have their blocks. And I've got some blocks in my workroom that I can show you. And they'd just, they'd have a tray here with the die set up, dip the block in there, die or print, move along and they'd re they had their own register quite often it was just a piece of paper with just a, a mark on it and they'd put that there and then they'd dip print dip print and they'd go all the way up the cloth and then they'd turn around and come back the other side then they'd get their second color and that would go on because by that time of course it had dried then they'd take them outside and they'd lay them in the dirt and we were horrified. They'd weigh them down with stones in the compounds on the dirt. And we go, you can't do that, that's terrible. But that's how they dried everything. And um, we saw them dying. They had massive indigo pots. Um, and the boys, they were about 14. And they dip everything in these, like Alibaba indigo pots, which were boiling away. And then it'd be pulled out and then spread on the clay. They had white china clay and the, the dyed fabric would go down on that and then they used that as a secondary um, thing to sell as well because it was um, impregnated with indigo. Look, it was the most fascinating tour and I came away with so many ideas going... Mm. Oh, I really appreciate the fact that you've, that you've been willing to share with us today and, and to be with us and to allow us into your lovely home. So thank you for that. Um, I believe you're going to read us a short, a short poem in a moment, yes. if that's okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the, the poem uh, that the, you were thinking of? The one, the one I've chosen is, some of my poems a little bit dark edged, um, and this one's about creating, and I just thought, because that's the sort of topic that we're working on, so I'd read that one for you. Uh, and it's called A Creation Sampler. Fabulous. Okay. okay. Thanks, Joy. I don't know this off the top of my head, so I'd have to read it. The skin of earth dangles wet from the dye pot, wrinkled. Indigo limbs peg it loosely above a dusty yard. The master dyer is satisfied. The dyer's smile it is now up to the stitches to ply their art across the weave. Long canther threads of startling silk in and out, in and out, a rhythm swiftly running like the rivers from the gods. When needle meets coarser tufts, a mountain forms on earth, a range of ridges heaven saw and valleys cut between. See this cluster? Villages cling to the slopes, puckered in swirling bandhani knots. Now the cloth is passed to chicken sewers. Faster, faster, under the quick fingers of the daughters. Lotus millet, curly bean leaves, petals of the yellow dal, roaming untamed over sleeves, up lapels, around a collar. Human is shaping, and down her back the tree of life. 
elephant, parrot, monkey, peacock, and last the humble sparrow. Now earth is whole, the master dire sighs, and sends her garment forth to meet the sun, reflecting off a thousand shishas. Who knows what their lives become? Millions clinging to their lands, forming castes, burning widows, women digging on the roads, others rise to meet the stars or are mown down by bodyguards. The dyers watch indifferently. You cannot own a coat once it is gone. The warp and weft of life unfold, tattered, ploughed, polluted, lush. Sometimes you are gifted choice, the dyers and weavers conspire to create a garment flecked with gold. But who shall wear it? That is moot. Fantastic. Thank you.